Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Tracy Cook. I'm the online media manager for ModernAnalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Four Ways to Optimize Customer Data for Deeper Insights. Today's featured speakers are Jen Underwood, Principal Program Manager, Microsoft, Dan Ganancia, Alliance Marketing Manager, and Scott Jones, Senior Solutions Engineer from Alterx. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. So please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions features of the GoToWebinar software. I'd like to say thank you to Alterx for sponsoring this event. Thank you and have a great webinar. Thanks, Tracy. Hey everyone, my name is Dan Gnanchel, and uh, again, thank you Tracy for that introduction. Uh, we're definitely very excited to be sponsoring today's webinar and presenting along with Microsoft. I know we have uh, many people here today that are analysts or manage analysts, so our goal on today's webinar is to basically show you ways in which you can reduce the time and complexity spent in working with customer data. Specifically, what we'll be looking to do is we will explore four ways in which to optimize your customer data in order to generate deeper insights. And so these ways will focus on enabling you to significantly reduce the time and complexity it takes to prep, blend, and analyze data for visualizations in order to produce valuable insights in hours, not weeks. We're going to explore these ways using a prescriptive analytics project as our context. And so we will look at a common use case common use case problem, break down the solution, and show how optimization of the data occurred to produce better results. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and begin. So analysts like yourself depend on massive amounts of customer data to produce actionable insights so that your decision makers can quickly react to ever-shifting customer demands. To keep up with changing customer demands, you rely on customer analytics for deeper insight targeted interactions, and improved marketing efforts. Customer data comes in many forms and from multiple sources, but that data can be messy, incomplete, and also difficult to process. Oftentimes, customer data files require significant manual cleansing and integration before you can truly analyze the results to deliver answers to your organization in a timely manner. So it's no secret that analysts spend significant amounts of time in the prep and blend phase manually writing formulas in Excel or programming coding processes to prepare lots of data. In addition, you might have to enrich the data as well as perform advanced analytics like predictive analytics to generate deeper insights into what your customer data is telling you. Then you need to analyze and share the data to help your decision makers visualize and understand trends in order to better target customers and prospects as well as optimize marketing efforts. So typically this entire data preparation to visualization process could take you up to several weeks to perform, right? I mean, a lot of people that we've talked to have told us, you know, I spend weeks, days and weeks just trying to get my data set prepared the way I want it. And in today's fast-paced world, spending this amount of time to generate insights is not ideal. Reacting rapidly is very important as your decision makers strive to keep up with changing customer demands. Hence, in your work with data, you need better ways to reduce the time and the complexity spent in manual data preparation and cleansing, as well as speed up your time to insight to keep up with the rapid pace of business. So to illustrate how you can be more effective and efficient in your work with data, we're going to take a look at a common use case that many organizations face. All right, so as mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, our particular use case is a prescriptive analytics project that focused on customer data optimization. The business also wanted to better target, produce, and maximize profits from direct marketing initiatives. However, this was not a straightforward, point-click, done type of task. The assignment entailed a multiple-step approach involving data blending and preparation, predictive analytics, and development of several individual models to be combined together. So the business analysts assigned to the project primarily used Excel to carry out a lot of the data blending and preparation tasks, as well as build out optimization models. The problem 
The business was challenged by an inability to unify customer marketing data across multiple sources. So blending the data together from various sources w was an issue for them. They also struggled with cumbersome data manipulation and inconsistent modeling in Excel. Uh, basically, they, they found that working in Excel was taking far too much time, and it also lacked the depth of sophisticated analytical capabilities needed to perform optimization modeling. Current processes and tools took too long to get the job done, basically. So the business needed a quicker and more efficient way to prep, blend, and analyze their customer data. And I'm sure you know, many of you on the call today can probably relate to this and probably face similar situations in your organization. So in order to solve for the business challenges, uh, the business decided to break the problem down into four distinct parts in order to figure out how best to optimize the customer data. Uh, this way they could then produce deeper insights focused on maximizing profit as well as focused on customer targeting and direct marketing initiatives. So what the four parts were, number one, it was to develop a probability model of catalog use. Number two was to develop a revenue model to assess the incremental gross margin that positive customer catalog use provides. Number three was to estimate expected gross margin percentage from each customer, for each customer. And number four was to create an optimization module to assist direct marketing managers in selecting uh, the proper mailing list and catalog items for targeting. So with that, the analyst decided the best course of action was to execute the solution by attacking it in four ways that we mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar. The first step was to make sure the revenue model solution was based off data that could show causalities between incremental gross margin and customer catalog use. So this would entail blending customer marketing data from multiple sources, blending it together. And so when looking to optimize your customer data for deeper insights, uh, one of the best practices that this analyst found that we found as well is to enhance and enrich your data set by combining it with other data that can help you dig deeper into cause and effect as well as trends and relationships. Furthermore, because the data comes from various sources such as databases, cloud applications, files, and, and more, it was important for the analyst and to the analyst that he be able to access all this data sources easily, bring them together quickly, and not have to spend multiple weeks trying to mash up the proper data set for analysis. So optimizing your customer data also means optimizing the process in which you blend that data together, and more on that to follow. The next step was to cleanse all customer and marketing data to remove bad data, outliers, and null data, thus optimizing the data for analysis. Uh, why this is important is, and why this was important to the, to the business, was with multi-million dollar strategic decisions being made off of the data-driven insights each and every day, it's, it's definitely a best practice to always fully cleanse the data before analyzing and visualizing it. Additionally, it's easy to miss things if you're manually cleaning up a very large data set. So our analyst knew this, and he wanted to employ ways to mitigate against this. Next was to predict the probability of catalog use and create an optimization module to assist in direct marketing efforts. So basically, the analyst wanted to perform joint optimization prescriptive modeling to evaluate results to see if the model really did live up to its implied um, return on investment prediction. Because, you know, as mentioned with, with the challenges, because Excel lacked the depth of analytical capabilities needed for this type of analysis, um, the analysts knew that this would have to be done with, with a predictive analytics tool. And ideally, um, with a tool that made it easy for him to perform because he was not the most technically savvy when it came to programming or coding in R. So how this translates into you know, a best practice to think about is um, optimizing customer data sometimes requires things that Excel can't do well or that are too technical to perform on your own. In this case, what you need obviously is a more intuitive tool that allows you to perform some of these complex predictive analytics easily. And the last thing that the analyst wanted to address was he knew that he also needed to visualize the customer data to produce deeper insights. Um, that would lead to better decision making for the decision makers um, to help them with the customer targeting and direct marketing optimization. And so what the analyst was focusing was basically optimizing the data, but also optimizing the way to produce and display what the data is saying. 
thus making it easier to understand the insights, which is key you know, in providing your decision makers with a more clear idea of what is going on. You can, do it, you can do a lot of this in Excel, but sometimes that's not necessarily the best tool for creating rich dashboards, reports, and visualizations, so the analyst uh, took to other means to accomplish this. Now, to execute on these four things, or I guess you say these four ways in optimizing the customer data, what happened is that the analyst employed two key tools. He used Altrix to reduce the time spent on blending and cleansing the data, as well as performing predictive analytics, and he used Microsoft Power BI to create rich visualizations that generated deeper insights. Those insights thus resulted in the following to the business. So here were the results of the project after carrying out uh, the optimizations in regards to the um, four ways that they would address their challenges. So the business conducted a direct mail campaign that was identical to the previous year's campaign with one exception. The most recent year's campaign was modeled out as noted in our solution. So in the previous year, before the optimization and before the modeling, the, the business saw results that were above average for, I'm sorry, the business um, yeah, saw results that were slightly above average for mail campaigns pre-predictive. It was a redemption rate of 3%. Um, but it, unfortunately, it was a marketing ROI of negative 39%. So not really a great campaign, and it cost the business more than the incremental margins generated. And as mentioned, that was one of the things that they were looking to improve, incremental margins from um, customers. And so fast forward to the recent year, and this is after employing a predictive modeling approach as well as optimizing the customer data. And the results are dramatically different. And so what, what the business saw is a redemption rate of 10%, so an increase there, and an ROI of plus 59%. So overall, the overall result was an average marketing ROI of 186% once they looked at everything across the board. Quite the turnaround after optimizing their customer data and the processes involved in doing so. Um, so with that said, so we've gone over you know, what, what the use case was that we saw in the business and how they were able to improve the results by optimizing their customer data and the processes involved um, through the four ways, blending, cleansing, predicting, and then visualizing the data. So with that said, let's actually see how this optimization was accomplished as well as give you an idea of what you can do in your efforts when working with data to better your efforts when working with customer data. So to do that, let's start with how the data was visualized. And I'm going to pass it over to Jen. So Jen, um, please show us how the analyst was able to speed up their time to insight by utilizing Power BI. Thanks, Dan. So what I have here is a global sales overview. And we talked about combining the information from Alteryx to other information such as demographics that may be in your data warehouse. So I've taken the Alteryx output and I've mashed it up with a database in the background. So I have it as a classic SQL Server database. Your adventure works is what we combine this with uh, to anonymize this example here. And I went ahead and did that by going into Get Data and going to SQL Server. And all of these different tables then came in. The relationships were automatically defined here. The next thing that you'll notice here, I have the Alteryx output. And how I got this here was, was quite simple. I went into Get Data. I pointed to the Excel file. And that, again, brought the information in so that I can report across two different data sources to really get what I would call the complete view of the ROI. So let's take a look here. Uh, what, we're, what we're really interested in is, in the predictive use case, the recency, frequency, and monetary value was determined to be significant in predicting the likelihood of the incremental revenue and the use of the catalog. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how I built this. Uh, this is the output of what we're going to be building. But we've been able to target and then put together what we thought would be the monetary value by each one of the regions using this analysis. So let me show you how I built this and how it's so nice to be able to visually 
explore the information to get insights that you would never get without doing that. So you're really able to target specific customers very intelligently with the products that they were interested in and most likely to purchase. So I'm going to start with it's the bar chart that I just showed. And we're going to put on here the region so that we're going to target this by country. I'm going to drill down to customer. And to do that, I'm just simply going to drag customer underneath the country region. And now I'm going to look at the incremental revenue. So I'm going to take the incremental revenue that was predicted and toss that into the chart. Now I want to look at not just incremental revenue, but the margin. So it doesn't matter if you're selling, if you're not making profit from it. So there's no point to it. So let's make sure we're targeting folks that have um, that are profitable folks to be targeting, good customers. And now it becomes a little bit more evident. You can take a look and we'll make these averages. And you'll start to see a little bit more information here. So Australia certainly has a lot of sales. And I can drill down and look at the specific customers. And I can sort and look at by incremental revenue to really look at uh, Walter Torres, Mark. Marco Patel, Colin Stone. So I can get a feeling for who those customers are that I should be targeting. To add some extra context to this, I want to look at what are they buying. So I'm going to take a table. In this case, I'm going to look at, again, I'm going to look at subcategory. We do a lot of targeting on the category, on the product catalogs at a, at a category, in subcategory level. So I'm going to drag that in there. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and look again at margin and incremental revenue. I'm going to grab that incremental revenue. We're going to grab margin. And now I'm going to, again, make it averages because I don't want this to sum up. And we can get a feeling here for how much the bike stands, for instance, are our highest incremental revenue. And for our highest margin products, we're probably looking at bike racks and touring bikes. To take this a bit further and really see uh, the customers and what we should be spending, and we talk about really targeting, and we're living in an age of personal offers and you know that personalized experience. Let's go ahead and throw a scatter on here. We'll stretch that out a bit, and again, I'm going to put in the subcategory because that's what we use our catalog at. And we're going to drill down to customer again to where we find my customer. This time, I'm going to take the RFM analysis stands for recency, frequency, monetary. We're going to take the average of the last days that they've bought something from us. So let's take a look and see if I can find where that is. Here we go. I want to put that on the x-axis. And then I'm going to go ahead and take frequency and put that on the y-axis. And that's not, right now, it's not really quite helpful. Let's take a look at, again, we'll put that on averages. And we're going to go ahead and add some more context in here. We're going to put the incremental revenue. So if I target this customer, how much more extra money will I get? And I'm going to put that into the size. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to color this by monetary value. So this is my high value customers. And this isn't too helpful as is. Um, we, we see a few things in here, but it'd be really nice if we had some labels. So let's go ahead and throw some labels on there. Ah, OK, so now we can see we have high value customers in tires and tubes. And we can take a look at where they are. So again, you know, Germany, France, United Kingdom. And we can now start to really look at these much deeper. Now, if I drill down, may want to look at those tires and tubes, I can go ahead and now get a feeling for the customers that are likely in that segment to target and really take a look at the, the individual details that I would need. If I wanted to say just narrow it down to um, Germany in this case, again, I'm taking a look at the customers, the margins. And I know specifically if I say, let's look at Janelle for a second. Let's click on her. I'll take the, the drill down off. I can get a feeling she likes helmets and shoes, caps, touring bikes. So now I can start to take this information on what they're buying as well to really customize that campaign. And if I want to make a pitch to my boss, 
to say, well, in order for me to do this, this is how much you're going to get back. Let's take a look and be able to answer those questions. I'll simply take a card here, and I'm going to go and add things like how many customers. So we'll look at the count of customers we'll be targeting in that campaign. We'll also look at, just copy that over. This time I want to look at the incremental revenue that I'm going to be bringing in at that specific segment. So I'll bring in my incremental revenue, so $3 million. And then, of course, we care about margin. So let's copy this again. We'll put it over. And we can always pretty this up after the fact. I uh, certainly wanted to share with you um, how I found about doing this. And we know that it's not that kind of margin. We know that we're probably looking at an average of 19. So now as I explore this information, maybe I look at United Kingdom, I can get a feeling for these are the folks that I'm targeting, we're looking at about 1,900 customers, and really get now I'm getting a much more granular, more intelligent way to target these customers. Now I think we're going to go ahead and pass it on back and learn how we got the predictive information in here that we use to match up to match up with our data warehouse. Thanks, Jen. So now you guys have seen how the visualization of the data occurred, but before you can do this, obviously you first need to put your or create your actionable data set, put it together. So Scott um, will take us through how Alteryx was utilized by the analyst to optimize for the blending of the data from multiple sources, the cleansing of the large data sets, and the building out of the predictive models um, for the optimization, modeling, and deeper analysis. Scott? Thanks, Jan and Jen. So we're going to go ahead and look at how Alteryx is able to go ahead and do this cleansing, preparation, blending, and pass it on to the visualization. And just for a little background, Alteryx is a drag-and-drop GUI programming language where we can easily take and connect to data wherever it may be, be able to bring your data in, you want to be able to take a look at that data, and you may need to cleanse it. And very often, we once we bring in, we have to get our data ready before we blend it. So just an idea of how to do that, where we can easily take our data and we can transition it based on what's coming in and with simple tools be able to put it to cleanse it and get it in the right format, be able to create formulas on the fly to create whatever we may need to use and add into our existing data. And we do this again with just dragging and clicking the things that we may need. So in this case, I might want to create a spend field looking at our, uh, our actual quantity that somebody purchased and multiplying that by the actual cost. So we can look at unit price, and that's going to start to build out our, our data that we may need. We can also blend data by bringing in other pieces of data and connecting to it. In this case, maybe bringing out uh, that SQL database. Jen was talking about we can connect to some data that may be in another one that we need to bring in. Again, taking our data, dragging out what we need, comparing it, and then joining it, again, with these drag-and-drop tool interface. We'll go ahead and choose what we want to join on. And now we've blended our data. Then the next piece we want to might we need to analyze our data. So we can take some of these tools, and this is with R in the background, but without having to code it. So we don't have to code anything that we're going to be doing inside of Alteryx. We can simply choose the options that we want, simply click on each one of them. And then when we want to look at it, we can drop in and browse the data as we're looking at it. This is going to allow us to go through, take a look at our data, make some assumptions about it before we pass it through a model or pass it out to our visualization. Once we're happy with what we have, we can prepare it again and aggregate our data to what we need. Simply choosing the fields we need, we're going to go ahead and summarize the information grab all the pieces that we just created, taking averages, taking summations, maybe even taking counts, and then sample the data for what's most important. So taking maybe the first 10% or the highest 10%. And now we've prepped, blended, cleansed our data and prepared it to go ahead out to a visualization. 
And we can do that again by simply dropping a tool. In this case, we'll go ahead and pass it directly to Power BI. And we can publish this to Power BI. And once it's published, we have access to just what you've seen to start building out your visualizations. So now that you have a background of sort of Alteryx and being able to use it and bringing in multiple pieces of data, being able to cleanse it, prepare it, blend it, let's take a look at what we actually worked on for our use case. So we had data in multiple sources. We had some customer data that we were working with, and it has information with monetary value and margin information. And we wanted to compare that to SKU level data. So we have some other inputs with SKU level data information as well, as well as that customer ID. So we had to go and do a few different things to really get our data ready uh, prior to even blending it. So with our customer data, the first thing we did was we're going to sort that data to find the highest monetary value and also add on a record count. And what this is going to allow us to do is by adding that record count onto our data is scale, we scale it as a monetary value uh, using that as a function of each customer compared to the entire population of customers. Doing some simple formulas and by passing it through here we can do formulas on multiple rows of data that are passing through. We create these new fields as you can see for our data down below showing our rescaled value for each of our customers at the SKU level. So that data has been cleansed, it's been prepared and we're ready to take a look at it. We want to join that with some of the SKU information. So we have our SKU and we're, we're going to uh, maybe choose specific SKUs that we want to look at. So we have a list of the SKUs sitting here. We'll take this list of SKUs and we're going to take out only the SKUs that pass or the ones that we've selected, uh, leaving out any of the data here that we can go ahead and do analysis on at a later time. We're going to filter based on a specific time that we want to look at that data. So we may only want to look at the last month or the last couple of months. So we're going to be able to filter that data out as well as giving a user an option of what dates they want to choose, what data they want to bring in, and, and the amount of data they want to pass through. Once we've filtered out and have the data that we need, we're going to aggregate this as well. So we're going to look at this data uh, grouped, uh, taking account of SKUs per transaction, per customer, and then we're going to go ahead and do a log transform on it. And this logarithm is going to allow us to come up with a log count for each of our SKUs to actually start to score them. So we have our data, we've prepped it, we've added the fields we need, we've cleaned it up to just the fields that we need, information that we need, so we can join it all together. So using our join tool, we're going to go ahead and compare the two different IDs that match up. They could be different names. In this case, uh, we were nice enough to have our IDs already named the same. And all of our data is now joined and blended together and ready to use. So the next step was to take that information and uh, see what else we can find with it and do a, a little bit of a prediction. So what we want to do is calculate the expected value per SKU uh, looking at uh, with all the information that we had. So we've joined together the data. We're going to create a new field that is our, our monetary value, so our calculated monetary value. We're going to aggregate this data again, uh, looking at the sum of all that uh, monetary calculated value per SKU. And what that gives us is for each SKU that we have, we get that, that calculated value. We can then sort that descending to get the highest monetary value at the top and take a sample of it. And this is the data that we want. So we just want the highest ones. In this case, we're taking the top 50. This is our first output, our top 50 SKUs that we can pass on and use that data either in another process or just pass that along to whoever needs that data. Uh, in this case, we're going to output this directly to an Excel file. Uh, but we can put it out to any format that's needed, including putting it right back into the database. Also, as shown with that Power BI, we can also pass that data at any point in this process up to Power BI Cloud. So we have our SKUs. They're all scored. And so we know which SKUs are sort of popping out based on our customer and the specific amount of time that we've selected. 
So now we can pass along and we're going to do a, a few more algorithms that we're going to create. We're going to summarize the transaction activity per SKU and find out for each customer how active they've been with regard to each SKU. So we do that with a summarize tool. So here we're taking and we're grouping by the customer ID, the date, the SKU, and we're finding out how many transactions there were. And then aggregating up again based on that customer ID and a total count overall. What that gives us is this customer ID and we get a categorization of the SKUs based on the date we selected. So we can take this number that's important to us and we're going to join it back with our original data back to our customer field. So you can see where we're bringing it through, we're choosing the fields that we need, and then joining it to the new data that we've created. And so that gives us all of our original data plus our new field. Again, we're going to use a formula tool. And this time we're going to do several formulas to actually create an expected incremental gross margin. So we're going to create a predicted gross margin uh, of what it's going to cost to send a catalog and compare that to what the actual expected return is for each of those SKUs per customer. So once we have that information, we get our output showing us all of our data going through, and again, this is at the customer level, what their expected incremental contribution, as well as the margin, and the expected return. So these are all predicted values that we expect. Now we can filter out this data to find who is going to be actual customers that if we send them this, the catalog's information based on the SKUs that we've selected back in the first part of our process, what the expected increment's going to be, and only select those customers where that margin is going to be higher than the cost to send that catalog or that marketing cost. You can remember back to what Dan spoke about, what the, where the increase of the marketing cost versus the actual uh, income that was created for those SKUs and where increment came from. And that's by only selecting and targeting specific customers that we want with those specific SKUs that matter to them. Once we have that data, we can clean it up, only take the fields that we need. We're going to go ahead and sort our data and get our final output showing our customers with their highest incremental expected return. Taking that data, again, that's data that we can pass out to Excel back to our database or pass it up to be used in your visualization as another piece of it. Now that we have all of our data created, this can be a process that can be repeated. So anytime you need to run this process, you simply hit the play button. Or by saving this, you can also share this with colleagues to continue to work on it, tweak it as you need because your model is going to change. You'll notice the entire process is notated step by step as to what it does. So as you share and collaborate with your colleagues, you're going to be able to see step by step what's going on, and they're going to be able to understand your process. We can also take the process and schedule this to happen as often as we need it to. So if this is something that you just need to run at the beginning of the day or every third Friday, maybe it's something you need to run quarterly to get that information back to run it a couple weeks before you're going to make that decision. You can have that process come through, get your results, and then pass that out to where your visualization and dashboard is going to be updated. You can run this from a local machine or connect out and run this as a server process. The other option is sometimes you need people who are the non-analysts, people that just need this information to go up and be able to utilize what you've built. So with the interfaces, you can also choose and create interface connections to each of these tools that will change the process based on what that user needs. That process can be run either from a desktop application like you see here or pushed up into the web where they can go to a website, choose their information, fill out the form, hit finish, and get the results they need either back in Excel form, saved up to whatever location they want, or pushed directly to a visualization that they can go over. So as you can see, this really fills in that whole piece of where we finish off by visualizing, analyzing our data, and really coming up with the pieces like Jen showed you. But getting your data prepared from multiple sources, blending it together, cleansing it, and then doing all the analytics 
is a very important part that needs to happen before you can really make all of your decisions. So I would thank you for being able to show this demo. I think at this point I'll go ahead and uh, toss it back to Dan, and uh, I think we'll look for uh, what kind of questions we may have. Thanks, Scott. So we definitely have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. It's glad to see. I'm glad to see like people are engaged. Uh, let me ask these questions to both Scott and Jen, and I'll go through them one by one. Um, and so we'll start first with you know as they came in. I'll just read them off the top of the list. So this one, Scott, I'm going to start with you. And we have a question. How does Altrix manage large loads of data? We get millions of rows in various tables, and we need to blend them on complex logic. Data may be in terabytes. Absolutely, and that is a question we get quite a bit, and also a very common thing we deal with quite a bit. So there's, there's several different ways we deal with that. We are an in-memory solution, but we also hybridize the use of your hard drive space uh, to extend that memory. Uh, we work with multiple terabytes worth of data. Uh, one customer in general I, I work with regularly gets about 40 billion rows a day. Much of this is done uses, utilizing our in-database tools to connect out to things like SQL and Teradata and Hadoop. And then also you want to do as much optimization within that in database before you bring it across as you can. However, we will not stop processing or have any limit to the amount of data you bring through. It really is based on memory. Uh, sizes like that we tend to push to our server type of instance. Okay, great. And I have another question here for you as well, Scott. So. Uh, one of our attendees would like to um, discuss how the Power BI tool in Ultrix works. It seems like there's a lot more than just saving the time of outputting a file and then connecting with Power BI. So could you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. So we've built a tool that makes use of uh, Microsoft Power BI's REST API. So once that data is created, prepped, and ready to go, we will push Data using a push service for the API up into your Power BI. So you'll get a pop-up screen asking for a login, so you'll need a Power BI login. Once you have that, that data will go ahead and show up in your Power BI data set. Okay, great. Also that is a, and yeah, just to point out, when you have Alteryx, that is a macro that you can open up. So you can actually see all of, and many of the tools in Alteryx are macros. You can open those macros and see uh, how we built them and uh, what's actually going on underneath. Okay. Uh, this question is for Jen. Jen, uh, an attendee here, would like to understand what governance controls you can get with Power BI. So it, it's great that there's a flexible tool, but how do you prevent creating a wild, wild west, letting everyone do anything they want? So I, I'm a very passionate blogger on that topic. At jenunderwood.com, I do have some blogs on how to do that. Power BI in general, if you're using, you want to use the enterprise data gateway, so you have a centralized manner for folks to access data sources. And this is a single version of the troop. We have groups. We have role-based security. There's different workflows and processes that you can put in place with things like OneDrive. So I, I recommend taking a look. Just search under governance. I also have a really funny blog called The Self-Service BI Fantasy um, that talks exactly about that and why I think uh, a lot of folks don't realize that they even have an issue until about a year or two after um, the problems have mounted up and it's become much more difficult to, to deal with. So we do have uh, some functionalities and we are releasing every week. So keep Keep tuned on additional enhancements in that area. Okay. And then the same the same person asked a follow-up question. Is there an audit trial capability or audit trail capabilities between Altrix and Power BI? Who did what when? I guess both of you can weigh in on that. Interesting. Uh, essentially from the side of Power BI, when you create a data set, there are timestamps and whatnot in the REST API. You can see when the last update and whatnot is. Sure, and on the Alteryx side, a log file is created every time you run Alteryx telling you step by step what happened, as well as a full XML code of the settings for each tool as it passes through a workflow. 
Yeah, another feature too on Power BI side would be when, when was the visual last updated? Uh, we do have that out of the box. So it won't tell you when that data set's been updated. You just choose whether or not you want to show that or see it. Okay, great. Uh, another user is asking a question. Could we provide the data in any format, Excel or other formats? Wh which are the accepted formats to provide the data so that alters can be used? We, we accept most any format, both uh, tabular, structured, unstructured, and uh, most major databases. Uh, with, with few exceptions, we connect uh, with uh, the standard ODBC drivers as well as many uh, direct built-in connectors that we have for both database and cloud connection. Uh, it's very rare we find anything we can't work with, and if it's something that doesn't bring, come in directly, typically we'll look at bringing it in as a flat file or a non-delineated text file, and then use our parsing tools to cleanse and prepare that data. Okay. So there's some, yeah, there's actually some really good tutorials on alterx.com as well as built into alterx in our sample files of how to cleanse and prep unstructured data. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, another attendee has asked, can alterx make suggestions on what could be the best items to join data on to get the best quality? So that's really not, that's not going to be a piece that's built in. Uh, you're going to want to take a look at your data, use our data investigation tools to see how things match up, what type of, uh, what type of results you're getting using those data investigation tools, and that's going to help you decide uh, what's going to be best to join. Uh, you can also use things like our lift chart to actually show you, based on scoring, uh, what variables uh, come off as most important and have the most effect on any model. Okay, great. Uh, another attendee, what if you receive an error when trying to cleanse the data? How are the records reconciled or corrected? So from the Alteric side, uh, when you get an error, yeah, it will show you and tell you exactly what the error is, what tool that error came from, and typically give you uh, an idea of what was causing that error. Um, as far as fixing it, it's a matter of going in and change. It may be a data issue or it could be something in the settings. So typically it's something like your data type was not set correctly when joining, something like trying to join a string to a number. As far as reconciling, we don't overwrite any data that we're bringing in. So data is all, all of that is happening in memory. So your initial data is never going to be overwritten or destroyed once you hit run. So there's no need for, to reconcile. Okay, and then as a follow-up to that from the same person, and what if the cleansing tool does not work? Does Alteryx isolate the record in question, or is that data then cannot be cleansed? Uh, well, there's there's no real cleanse tool. So it's a, it's a series of data preparation tools you're going to use to cleanse your data. So if it is one specific record that you're finding, you can always filter that record out, but it is going to tell you which record erred. In, mo in most cases, uh, um, depending on what the error is. Uh, something like a field is too large, but if it's uh, something like I said with the data field type and the entire field needs to just uh, be fixed, uh, you can do that You know, utilizing a select tool to change that. Okay, great. Now, here, here's a question in specific to the predictive part of um, working with the data to optimize it. Uh, one attendee looked on the workflow and and was just simply asking, why did we do the log transformation? So uh, the idea behind that was we didn't use the predictive tools in this specific use case. Uh, they uh, chose not to. Uh, honestly wanted to do the use the algorithms. So the log transformation was done and then taking an exponential of that and adding it together. And there was about five, or sorry, about six different formulas that put all that together to do all the math. Uh, fortunately, we have a, a somebody who's way better than predictive than I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm very good at demoing the piece, but as far as the math behind it, uh, the idea was really to find out what the margin was based on the count of total people creating a percentage of what that customer's worth and then what each SKU's worth was. And then by creating a log, uh, a log rhythm of that, you're going to be able to use, compare it to what happened in the past and create a prediction. Um, 
definitely something I'd probably take more offline, but happy to talk with about. And you may also check out our community uh, for some more information about that. So community.alterx.com has a lot of great places to ask questions like that and what's probably already answered. Let me chime in on that as well. I just tweeted I have a blog on this original case study. We were not able to show the real customer data, you know, because it's sensitive, but it's really an awesome, uh, probably one of my favorite blogs of all time, uh, Maximizing ROI with Prescriptive Analytics. I tweeted it. Uh, we'll go through, and the, the group that built it shared much more detail exactly what they've done here. Perfect. Great. Uh, and then, so Jen, here's a question about Power BI. Um, are teams of people, let's say, you know, there's a f several individuals using it, are they able to work simultaneously in the same Power BI dashboard at the same time? If not, how does that work? Yeah, technically you can. Um, you would put it in a group, and that's, I'm actually doing that. We have a Gartner BI Bake Off coming up this weekend at the summit in Texas, and I'm doing that right now with a few groups on my team. So in, the, in Power BI, there's the concept of groups, and you can indeed share your dashboard and your reports with a group to do that. Okay, great. Uh, and then Scott, if, if data is increasing, this, this person said 10 million per month, then what kind of hardware do we need? And I guess this is both to run Ultrix as well as Power BI. Yep. So for Alteryx, and we even have technical specifications and what we suggest on the website under our products, technical specifications. Uh, but you're going to, depending on, yeah, there's going to be an increase. And typically, as things grow, you're going to move from desktop to server. Uh, as you move to server, the expansion, people tend to want to add more memory. But really, we find that a scale out to multiple nodes tends to run better because then different things can run different processes. We do take advantage of multi-threading on several of our tools, uh, but find that after four cores uh, on the desktop side, really that's just for secondary processes. So uh, stick with the four cores, go up, and get your. Uh, I'm running a 16, uh, 16 gig machine with a, and then the other thing that's going to help is as far as your your input output uh, going with a, a SSD is always going to be great for writing out things, and it's a much much faster process with that, especially with things. Uh, like spatial geocoding. Okay, great, great, great. And um, the same person also asked a follow-up question. Uh, he noticed that in the version of Alteryx you're using, he may not have the same type of tool sets. He was just wondering what version of Alteryx were you demoing on? Sure. So I am running the, the most ver recent version. It's just uh, 10.1.7.5 other numbers uh, that you can get from downloads.alteryx.com. Some of the tools that you'll see on my canvas you may not have because you may not have installed the predictive tools, which you can go to help and install predictive tools. Also, I have the uh, other toolkits, like uh, I've installed the Microsoft toolkit, the Tableau toolkit, and so on, uh, that you can get from our website. And then you can also create your own tool sets. Uh, there's instructions on the community on how to do that to create a folder with your own macros or macros that you've downloaded from gallery.alteryx.com. Okay, awesome. Uh, here, here's a cool question. So, user, uh, I'm combining actually a few people's questions. Uh, one person asked, can you address unstructured data? He works with live conversations often to do conversation mapping, and how would Alteryx enhance the conversation mapping, assuming he can provide the conversations in digital format? And then along with that, um, someone also asked, you know, they heard that we can do sentiment analysis through Alteryx. Um, with Microsoft, how does that work? Sure. So uh, I'll take a piece of that, and, and, and Jim may want to follow up with what I say. But uh, as far as digital, uh, when we talk about unstructured, we're typically looking at things like HTML code, or it's going to be textual data of some some form. Uh, dealing with uh, digital is going to be in blobs, where we can bring them in, but we can't really see them as much. So you're going to want to have transcriptural data of that. It's going to be much more helpful. But yes, we can take that data in textual format, clean it up, and then use the uh, the ML text analytics tool. So we're actually using uh, the Microsoft uh, text analytics that's from the Cortana engine to be able to do sentiment analysis scoring as well as pulling out keywords and bring that in a, 
and blend that with the data you already have. Um, so that it becomes very helpful. I've been using it quite a bit and doing uh, several demos on using that the, the ML text analytics tool. Great. Jen, question for you. Um, follow up to the Altrix Power BI tool. Does does Altrix, or I guess it's for both of you, does Altrix work with Power BI desktop for data we want to keep on premise? I can definitely take that one. Um, essentially, yeah, you can absolutely output. And in that case that I had an Excel file, you could have a CSV, you could be outputting to a database. You can absolutely, essentially it's an output destination that you would be using there. And in a lot of in a lot of cases, you may not want to put it as the data set um, in the service because you're going to want to be able to play with it a bit more. Um, so it's a matter of what you want to do. But for me personally, I do enjoy still authoring locally and having that ability to keep it in a database. Um, the data sets when you're working with the REST APIs do have some limits and um, are not as easy necessarily to work with when you're only in the cloud. So yeah, my preference personally is to output and you can output to many destinations. Great. And then here's a question. Can you develop a process that always happens? People can't change it, but could view it. And I'll, I'll say this for both Altrix and Power BI. Could you do this in both? I'll go ahead and start. So uh, for, for Altrix, yes. So you can create a process that cannot be changed. Uh, we do have the ability to lock them down. So you can, uh, especially use, uh, utilizing a macro and creating your own macro tool uh, that cannot be, uh, it can be looked at, but it can't be changed. Uh, it actually blocks it from being open. Um, the, other, the other option is when it's in and shared and collaborated with a gallery, uh, you have full control over whom and when anybody can go in and look or change uh, any of the processes that you build. Okay. And, and Jen, from the Power BI side, um, Well, there's definitely that? ways that you can, there, so when you, if you choose to output, your data sets have permissions on them, right? So you can do it at that level, on a data set level, but you can also share a dashboard, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, where it's more of a read-only, read they can't even uh, get to the underlying report. They only get to read um, and see and interact with the pieces that they've been giving. And for example, at Microsoft, we use that. We have a read-only dashboard that I can see how many people are using the system and see how we, you know, when we market it or we've gone to campaigns with the results of then. But I can't play with that data at all. I can't even really see the underlying data in there. I can just see the output. Okay, great. Here's a question going back to optimizing the data specifically on the blending um, way or the blending part of it. Can you provide more information around the, or, I'm sorry, the cleansing part. Can you provide more information around the cleansing process, i.e., does all the columns from all multiple sources have to have the same name? Uh, no. Uh, so you can join, you can choose whatever name. The only uh, specification is that they are a data type that can be joined together. So a number to a number or a string to a string, uh, spatial object to spatial object. Uh, so any of that can be blended. As far as cleansing, uh, again, it's just uh, preparing your data, getting, removing any fields or data that you don't want, also creating new fields or adjusting fields that uh, may, may need some changing. For instance, the one we did where we aggregated up uh, I needed to create a new field called spend. I used two other variables to create that, but then I was able to remove the fields that I no longer needed uh, uh, because I'd already created my new field. So that's a part of cleansing right there. Uh, it has nothing to do with field name at all. Okay. And Jen, for you, um, in regards to Power BI, are we able to create dual access chart in Power BI? Yes, that was one of the first things that we uh, released. And there's a chart that has, you'll see bars on it and lines. But I had, to, I had to giggle when I first came back to Microsoft. It's already been almost two years. It was about a year and a half. And I talked to somebody, and they said, I could tell you the top 10 things that people request in my sleep. And it was color control. And the second thing was the dual access chart. So we absolutely had it. 
Um, if you're using the Power BI in Excel 2013, I highly urge you to download and use the, Power, the free Power BI desktop. That is where you're going to do, be able to do so much more cool things. I didn't show custom visualizations. I didn't show our visualizations and all the cool stuff that you can do there. But that is where your know, Power BI desktop is where you're going to be able to do things like that, um, not, in, not in the version that's in Excel. Okay, awesome. Uh, so going back to the predicting part, uh, I have a attendee here that would like to know, where can I find more information about predicting without coding? I, basically, he wants to understand how, how to do that without knowing, you know, how, how to code an R. Absolutely. So the, the place I would go is uh, if you have Alteryx installed already, go to the help menu and install the predictive tools if you have not. And also, you can do a drop down under the help under samples, and it's going to have several different examples of predictive workflows that show how you can do these predictive models without having to code. Also, check out uh, some, some of the blogs on community.alterx.com. Just search predictive, and you'll see several blogs on there about those predictive tools and how to use them. And then staying on the topic of predictive, will our visualizations be coming to the web service? And I think he's asking this for Altrix. So uh, we do have our visualizations that are out there, and you can pass those as HTML. However, uh, as far as a web instance, uh, the only web instance we have is, 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 is the short demo, so we don't really have something like that right now. However, you can create reports and pass that information along um, as well in a, in a, in a HTML-type form. OK, great. Um, so I know we're coming up here two minutes left before the hour, and I want to be respectful of Erwin's time. There are several more questions that have been asked, so thank you for asking. I'm sorry that we were not able to get to those, but we can definitely follow up with you um, after the webinar. Uh, other than that, I just, I'll pass it back to Tracy. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Tracy? Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that was a great webinar. We're getting lots of great questions. I'd like to say thank you to Jen, Dan, and Scott for such a great webinar today and Alteryx for sponsoring today's webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar is being archived right now and will be posted to modernanalyst.com within a few business days. And this concludes today's webinar. Thanks. Have a great day.